so I have this. So the previous class we got you can see this color, right? Square is basically d theta square plus sine square theta d phi square. Okay. So this is known as the Schwarzschild geometry. Okay. So first exact solution of Einstein's field equations of general relativity and <coughs> obtained by Carl Schwarzschild. And this basically describes the metric. The, this is basically a vacuum solution of Einstein's field equations, spherically symmetric vacuum solution of Einstein's field equations. And it basically describes the metric outside a spherically symmetric star with this capital R. Is fine. We are not deriving it, we shall derive it later from. We shall learn how to get this solution from Einstein's field equations later. But if you have a star like this, a spherically symmetric star, the, the, the space time geometry outside the star is described by this metric. Okay. Now, <coughs> yes, what is the problem? No, no, that is fine, that is fine. Don't worry about that. So, when you will see it, if you want to see it, then you will see it. Okay, good. Now, I, I told you that in the previous lecture that <coughs> suppose you have some, someone sitting over here and he's emitting some signal with frequency over the start, then the frequency that one receives at, at infinity, omega, which is omega at infinity, this is the frequency of this same signal received at an infinite distance from this object. That will be uh, given by one minus what we what we have seen earlier. It was <coughs> one minus So the frequency that you will see at infinite distance that we derived earlier from that rocket thing by applying the principle of equivalence, we showed that the relation was this. Now, today our aim, as I mentioned earlier in the previous class, that we shall try to derive the same result using this geometry. Okay. <clears throat> For that, let us consider the following figure. So you have P and R, R and P. And suppose that, by the way, you can <coughs> let us call this capital. Okay, let's call this capital R or R. 
it's better to call it capital R S. Uh, <coughs> okay, and suppose here you have some observer is is a stationary observer situated at this radius. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another thing is that I will say that the radius of my star is equal to this. Okay, <clears throat> so this duration is in our cap, and this duration is. In our and there is some stationary observer here, and light signal is being emitted, and that is being received at some this is some arbitrary radius of small r, and small r is much greater than greater than that. And this light signal is being emitted not necessarily in the radial direction, it is in any arbitrary direction <coughs> with frequency minus star. So this is the radius of the star. From here, light is being emitted with frequency in the star. Not necessarily in a radial direction, but in any arbitrary direction. And here you have the stationary observer. Some observer is sitting here. And it is being received at this arbitrary radius, where there is another stationary observer. His radius is much, much larger than capital R. Okay? And <coughs> let us see. I mentioned to you that the energy in general relativity in G A B A and these are all stationary observers. For convenience, I will just delete, I will call this as Okay, this is my notation. U B observer, the four velocity of the observer. So, in order to measure the energy of the particle, you need not only the four momentum of the particle whose energy you are measuring, but also the four velocity of the observer. Right? So, I assume that this U B, which I called as U observer, is now this thing. This is normalized to minus one. Now, what is this thing? This thing you can write it down as G A B U A U B. So, we are using the of C. You can do it. You know what it is. Okay. So, G A B, you can write it like this. <coughs> and this is a stationary observer. Let us assume that this is stationary. What will happen? If this is stationary, then so all these observers are stationary observers. The one who is emitting the signal and one who is receiving the signal. Both are stationary observers. So it has only this direct component. And therefore, this we can write it down as G naught naught. Because all other components are zero. When you expand this, is this point clear or should I do it? It is clear because let me just do it for once and it will be clear to you. So these are repeated indices, so it is summed over. So we just sum it 0, V, Q0, QB plus UB. I is running from 1 to 3. <coughs> and 
and now we expand b so this will be 0 0 0 0 0 plus again i component but g0i is of that it is it is the diagonal matrix so of that my component 0 so that is gone and ui is already 0 because there are no special components so that term is gone so only g0 0 this term survives Right? Now this is equal to minus 1. This would imply, this implies that u0 square is equal to minus 1 by 0. And what is that? <coughs> g0 0 is this thing with the minus sign. So you will get 1 divided by 1 minus okay g00 is this full thing. so minus minus cancels and like this so if you have this then this therefore means that u0 is equal to okay this is what u0 is <coughs> so what can we write down now and therefore write down the following thing that u a observer is equal to okay what do you observe that it means sitting at arrays or in general, this is a function of r, small r. In general, this is a good, good question for which observer? In general, for any stationary observer situated at any arbitrary r. This you can write it down as Where what is IA? Right? Right, you know, So, UA observer is this multiplied by IA. <coughs> so, this is a this is a time like vector. It's a vector in the time duration along the time duration. This particular vector has a name which is called Killing vector. Killing. It's called a Killing vector because it tells us that there is a particular symmetry here. What, what is that symmetry? That is, this, this is a time-like vector. So if you move along the time-like direction and you note the form of the metric, you will see that the metric components G00, GR, they do not change along the time like direction. So, along the time like direction, the metric does not change. So, there is a time like symmetry, time translational symmetry. And this time of killing vectors basically give you the symmetry vectors or tell you about the symmetry directions. Okay, so UA observer is this. And now, we are ready to calculate what e is. So, sir, depending upon the uh, metric, uh, the killing vector of uh, and killing vectors will be different for different symmetries. This particular metric is a static yeah. metric yeah. because the metric components do not have any t dependence. Yeah. So, if you move along the t direction, there will be no change. Yeah. So, t is, so moving along the t direction is a symmetry. So, this is a time translational symmetry. So this is a, this vector is a time-like feeling vector.
Now let us calculate its capital. <coughs> capital D, by the way, you can contract this, you can write this as PA UA. I am not writing observer anymore. Hmm. Remember that there is something observer. So E is equal to this. Accident. Huh. That means along the killing vector, the observer doesn't feel the effect of the metric at all. No, no, no. The time, if you move along the time like direction, there is no change. There is no change in the metric. But why will the observer not feel the effect of the metric? Metric to is there is there. But there, there is no change in money. If you move along this direction, metric will be the same. Okay. So E is equal to this. But what is UA? UA is this multiplied by the killing vector, time like killing vector, where xi a is 1, 0, 0, 0. So you can write this as xi a multiplied by okay. Now, if you have this expression, you can now say that at this point, when you are at R, capital R, you just remove this, R is equal to Gm by C square, C is 1, so let us remove this also. Let us forget about this, let us forget about this. This is not a table for the Let me not call R is equal to function. I tell you what, this is not R is equal to function. This is the radius of this star. Otherwise, it will be a problem. This is any arbitrary radius. This is not 2GM. Okay. This is the radius of the star. Let me just write it down here. This is the radius of the star. Don't confuse it with RS. RS is this thing, but RS and RF are unequal. So if this is true, now when you are at this point, this is the surface, the surface of the star, and the observer who is stationary here, he is emitting the signal, and that signal has frequency omega star. So what we can write is this energy E is equal to h bar omega star and that is equal to this smaller will now get replaced by capital R. So this will be 1 divided by 1 minus for convenience I can write this down as Rs by R because 2gm is Rs. So C is 1, 2gm is Rs. So this is Rs by R because this smaller is capital R. Now at this position, at the radius of the star. So this is a square root. And it down. H omega star. I'm writing it down. I will. So now this is P A by A. Evaluated at the R. And you have this factor. This is when the signal is emitted with frequency omega star from the surface of the star. So energy E that is equal to minus PA UA. That is my, minus PA UA is nothing but UA you put, put it. UA is this factor multiplied by psi H and evaluated at capital R at the radius of the star and that, that I equate it to H per omega star. Is this clear? 
I hope this is clear. And when you receive it here at <coughs> smaller or at infinity, right? At infinity, because you want to take this limit ultimately to infinity, there we have h bar omega infinity. For r infinity, this is 0, so this factor is 1. So what we shall have is minus p a by a at infinity. Clear? Should we eta? Just be clear that this is capital R, this is not RS. Because RS actually for a for this kind of stars, RS is actually much less than capital R. RS is actually much less than capital R. You can actually calculate it. Because if you put in the mass G and divide by C square, you will get a value of RS for this solar mass thing, and you will find it to have to be about three kilometers. 3 kilometers, but radius of this white dwarf, suppose if this is white dwarf, this is 1000 kilometers, so it is much, much smaller. So just make that correction, this is not equal to 2 gm. Okay, so if this is clear, if this part is clear, now we shall make an input, the input is the following, that this P is IA, is a constant. Along a, geodesic, along a geodesic. It's a constant along a geodesic. Now, what do I mean by a geodesic? A geodesic, roughly speaking, we shall come to it in details later. A geodesic is basically the shortest distance in a curved manifold. The shortest distance between connecting two points in a curved manifold. Just keep this in mind for the time being. This PSIA is a constant along a geodesic, not along anything else. We shall prove it later. Once we learn what geodesics are, we shall prove this result. But for that, we need to have the uh, understanding of geodesics. So if that is true, then you can basically set this and this equal. Or what you can say is that since this and this are equal, therefore h bar omega star is equal to uh, <coughs> 1 divided by 1 minus Rs by capital R square root h bar omega infinity. Because this and this are equal along a geodesic, but since this and this are equal, but and this is equal to h bar omega infinity, therefore from this equation you have this relation. Okay? So if that is true, then this is constant along geodesic. How can you say that uh, English of radial geodesics and inputs. And you can always use that, that fact. You will take that particular trajectory where this is. Where you can use that property. So you have this relation. So omega star is related to this by this. And therefore, from that relation, you can immediately see that on this relation you can immediately see that omega infinity is equal to and this is the exact relation that I told you you will get exact gravitational redshift relation so it basically tells you that the frequency of the signal or the energy of the signal that you will make, that will be measured by an observer, by a stationary observer at infinity, that will be smaller than the energy of the signal or the frequency of the signal emitted from the surface of the star. So this is smaller than this because it's a negative sign, and therefore it tells you that since the frequency is smaller, therefore it is red shifted, and the red shifted is due to gravity. So this is gravitational red shift. So this is the exact relation following from the Schwarzschild geometry. And now, you know, Rs by capital R is very small, right? Because this is 3 km and this is 1000 km. So you can make a binomial expansion. And therefore, you get Rs by 
R omega star. And if you put what RS is, and you can now restore back C square for dimensional consideration from dimensional consideration because gm by c square is actually as the dimension of length so the length by length is dimension this so this is the result that i derived earlier from that equivalence principle block it this was the approximate relation and this is the exact relation which you can derive from the exact metric for such geometry metric okay do you have any question at this point yeah. Uh, in uh, the rocket resolution, there is some discrepancy that doesn't lead to the actual result. Because you are using some Newtonian equations and things like that. That is why you are getting some approximate result. Because we started, the, that was the first problem that you pointed out. Yeah. All these are Newtonian. Yeah. You are using Newtonian equations. So no wonder that you are not exact, getting the exact relation. Yeah. You are using Newtonian equations. Or Newtonian gravity, rather. We were using Newtonian gravity. So that was the reason that we were getting that approximate result. But it, it is not a wrong result. It should be consistent. So if you work out from a more fundamental theory, which is the Einstein's theory, you get the exact result, and which reproduces the approximate result in, in the appropriate unit. So this, this tells us that everything is fine. And this is all about what I wanted to tell you about the gravitational redshift. The only things that I have not mentioned to you here is that I have assumed two things I have assumed. I have assumed the Schwarzschild metric that we shall do later. How do you get the Schwarzschild geometry? And the second thing that I have assumed is that this is a constant and a particular geometry. But to prove that result, I will prove that result in a, in a couple of lectures. This is not very difficult to prove. We shall prove it. But to get to the Schwarzschild geometry, it will take us some time. Okay. So if you have any questions at this point, you can ask. Otherwise, we shall proceed. Okay. Okay. Will also generate the energy conservation of yes, yes. If there is a space like killing vector, then we will not able to do this kind of process. No, energy will not conserve. Is some, some sort of energy conservation. Mm -hmm. And this factor that you are getting here is basically called the gravitational redshift factor or the gravitational time dilation factor. Now, from now on, we have to look at the mathematical part and we shall start with some geometry to go deeper into what general relativity is. So, let us consider a curve. Let us consider any arbitrary curve. No. So, this curve I call it no. In some manifold, so there are some. Some objects that I shall, some terms that I shall take this is a manifold. Manifold roughly, you can, I will not give you the rigorous definition of manifold is, but you can think that any curved surface is a, you can think of it, you can call it a manifold. For example, the surface of a sphere, that is a manifold. Okay. And on that arbitrary curved surface, you have some curve like this, which, which I call gamma. Okay. And it is described. The curve is parameterized by lambda. Is parameterized by lambda, and in any arbitrary coordinate system, it is described by the coordinates x a lambda. In any arbitrary coordinate system, this the points on this curve is described by the coordinates x a lambda. Lambda is the parameter with which the curve is parameterized. And you can define functions of these coordinates defined on this curve like this. These are functions of these coordinates. What we wish to calculate is the following. We wish to calculate the rate of this function is 
this f is a function of these coordinates. This function is a scalar quantity. Is a scalar. Okay. It's some, it's some number. Just no indices, right? So if you go from one frame to another frame, you will get the same number. It's a scalar quantity. So then you define a function along the path. Right? You define the function. It's a function of these coordinates. The coordinates are basically the points on this curve. So in some arbitrary coordinate system, you have this point as something. Okay, that point you define that function. And Curve is on some manifold, on any arbitrary manifold. And what we wish to calculate is the rate of change of this function f along the curve. So we wish to calculate if some kind of velocity like, like it will give some kind of velocity as we shall see now. We wish to calculate what curve is parameterized by this parameter lambda. We wish to calculate the rate of change of this function f with respect to this uh, parameter lambda. Along, along the curve. Example, if you are confused with this description, example, we have seen already an example. You can think of a circle. Circular equation, what is the equation of the circle? x square plus y square is equal to a square. Now, the same circle you can write it down as what? x is equal to a cos theta. So, theta is a parameter. So, you circle, these are the parametric equations. The same thing like also the example of the uniform acceleration problem. We have seen the function says the x function of tau that was c square d cos hyperbolic g tau by c. So those are written in terms of actually you got a hyperbola, but now you are writing it in terms of parameter tau. So it, those hyperbolas are parameterized by tau. The same thing here, so you want to calculate this, and this you can write it down as del f can be any function. F is any function, any function. So you can write this, this is chain rule. Okay. So from here, this procedure immediately allows us to define two different quantities. F A and U A. What is U A? This makes a D lambda. So this is this is what this is a vector. I will define. I will tell tell you rigorously what a vector is. It has a particular transformation property. So U A is this. It's a vector. And what what does this vector tell you? It tells you that is basically d x a d lambda. So at this point is basically a tangent vector. So this U A is a tangent vector to this curve comma every point. Way. So this is a vector, or it's more precisely a tangent vector. And what is this? This is called a dual vector. It's a dual vector, <coughs> which is basically nothing but accident. Which is basically nothing but the gradient of the function mm -hmm. ah. so that should not be x a lambda is equal to x a that should be a uh, i'm not writing x a lambda is equal to x a i'm writing here to here this is i'm calling this If a, since the index is here, I'm writing it down. This I'm calling it to be okay. This is a dual vector. 
Now we would like to look at the transformation properties of these objects. <coughs> Suppose I make a transformation of coordinates, coordinate transformation from x a to x prime, from x a to x prime. Under this coordinate transformation, if a x, I'm writing in short x, u a, this is also a function of x. This will transform to if Prime A is prime. Okay. <clears throat> or it is just let us look at the individual transmission for the time. Let us look at only this thing. We will do the lab the this one later. <clears throat> so this is what this is a scalar, so you can just forget about this. So this will be just del f, del x prime b. Now you just put the chain rule here. This will be del f, del x b. So this, this object, this dual vector or the gradient of the function f, f a x under this coordinate transformation goes to this thing and this is equal to del f del x prime a. Now you apply the chain rule del f del x b del x b del x prime a. B b are repeated in basis, so they are summed over and this is equal to del x b del x prime a. And this particular thing is nothing but FB. Okay. <coughs> let us now, under the same transformation, let us now look at what is UA, how does UA transform? U a function of x transforms to u prime a function of x prime that is equal to d x prime a d lambda that is equal to del x prime a del x b <coughs> Correct. Again, chain rule. This is in this coordinate system d x prime a d lambda. Now you apply the chain rule. B B repeated, so it is summed over. And therefore, this is equal to l x prime a d x b d x b d lambda. That is nothing. So you can see that under this coordinate transformation from x a to x prime a, this tangent vector to the curve at any point, this transforms in this way, and the dual vector, which is the gradient of the function, this transforms in this way. So anything which transforms in this way, we shall call it to be a vector. More precisely, since the index is on top, we shall call this to be a contravariant vector. And anything, any object which transforms this dual vector, which transforms in this way, the index is downstairs, we shall call it to be a covariant vector. Contravariant and covariant vector. Clear?
So if you have doubts here, you can ask. I think quite simple because we are just applying plain and simple chain to the arguments. So let us now see under this coordinate transformation how does this product transform. This product, by the way, is nothing but dfd lambda. If you remember, this is dfd lambda. <coughs> so this will transform to f prime a x prime u prime a x prime and that is equal to f prime a x prime that transforms like del x b del x prime a f b x and how does this transform? You have derived the transformation property that is del x prime a del x c. I will not use b anymore because b repeated indices cannot appear more than twice. It's a different index del x c. <coughs> So this is one second I repeat, this is a contravariant vector. So anything which transforms in this way is a vector, first of all, anything, anything and index the index on top I will call it contravariant, index, index on bottom I will call it covariant. Now you can see, just look at this factor and this factor. Del x b, del x prime a, del x prime a, del x c. Chain rule. If you apply chain rule, so this will be del x b, del x c. Then you will have f b x u c x. Okay. This is nothing but delta b c. It's a chronic delta, right? Delta Pc. So you can get rid of this chronic delta. So this C will get replaced by B. <coughs> so you can see that this object transforms under this coordinate transformation like a scalar. It does not transform at all. So this is the transformation property of a scalar. So, what is a scalar basically? If you have a function f, function of x, under coordinate transformation, if you go to f prime, x prime, and that will be equal to fx. This is the definition of a scalar. Anything which transforms like that it is, a, it is called a scalar. So, you can see that the rate of change of the function around the, with respect to the parameter lambda, which by which the curve is parameterized, that particular thing is also scalar quantity. And if we have learned by this from this exercise, what we have learned, what contravariant vectors are, what covariant vectors are, what is a tangent vector, what is a dual vector, which is a gradient of a function, and what is a scalar. So we have learned all these things, all these objects and their transformation properties. Good. So let us proceed further. <coughs> Again, at this point, <coughs> but we can just keep it in our notebooks, a tensor of type n, n. What is a tensor of type n, n? So let us consider the quantity T so there are indices here, 
which are on top. So these are called contravariant indices, and there are indices downstairs. These are covariant indices. Okay. <coughs> so this object, I will call it to be a tensor of type n, comma n. First of all, n and m basically denotes the number of indices on top. These are the n, and these are the m. Okay, that is why n, comma m. So what was this U A? What kind of a tensor it is? Is a tensor of type one comma zero. And what is this one? Tensor of type zero comma one. Okay, a contravariant vector is a tensor of type one comma zero. Covariant is a tensor of type zero comma one. Now, why tensor? If this object under the coordinate transformation that I that I wrote down, x a to x prime a, under any arbitrary coordinate transformation. If this object transforms like this, <coughs> J and this. If this object under this coordinate transformation transforms in this way, then only we will call this object a tensor of type n comma m. Otherwise, not. This is the transformation property. Please note that what I am writing, all these things are important. You have to write the arguments. If you don't write the argument, and for example, if you don't write the argument, it is wrong. If you if you write the argument, but if you write x, then also it is wrong. You have to write x prime. All these things are very important. So that is why I wrote the x here. This is some x. X prime under coordinate transform it transforms like this. The prime here is also important. If it has this transformation property, then it's a tensor of type n comma n. But the gravitational. So we have learned about this metric tensor. What the kind of a tensor is this? The tensor of type zero comma two. Why is it a tensor? It has it transforms like this in this way. It is a covariant tensor, second rank tensor or tensor of type zero comma two because there are no indices on top, two indices downstairs. So this is a metric tensor. It is called a metric tensor. Sir, how can I know that this is? I mean, first of all, this is a tensor, and second of all, this denotes the. I mean, this is a. I mean, metric tensor. I mean. We know by experience that this is a metric tensor. We can do with this, but how can we guarantee that this is a tensor? I mean, mathematically, how can we? Oh, mathematically, okay. This is a good question, actually. See, you write. So how will you prove that the GAB is a tensor? These are metric coefficients. These are functions of x. How will you prove that this is a metric tensor? Check whether it transforms. But how? Check whether it. Basically, this this thing transforms in this way. Check d a square is equal to d a square is equal to d a square. So if you impose that under any arbitrary coordinate transformation, x a to x prime a. If the line element d s square is invariant, then you can prove that G A B transforms in a tensor. So please do it as an exercise. Keep it as an exercise. <coughs> And we have already learned from our from the examples that we have seen in the previous class that this this quantity actually describes the gravitational field that we have already seen. The metric tensor describes the gravitational field. And it is also used to define inner product between two vectors. 
the inner product between two vectors can also be is defined by using this metric tensor and it is also used to raise and lower indices that is also an important thing <laughs> so by that i mean that if you have any four vector like this you can write it in this way so it basically means that using this metric tensor the contravariant metric tensor here you are raising the index and using this covariant metric tensor you are basically basically lowering the index on top and downstairs so raising and lowering it is the metric tensor is used to lower and raise indices and it also describes the gravitational field that we have already seen and your question is quite pertinent why is this a tensor we just demand that this is invariant under general coordinate transformations so these transformations are called gcp general coordinate transformations so if you demand that under a general coordinate transformation this will remain invariant then you will be able to prove it it's quite straightforward so do you want to do it on the board do you want to do it who will come who will come on the board junior okay. it's quite simple joyshi joyshi do you want to come joyshi let joyshi because the question raised is raised by joyshi next time monjari will know <clears throat> so this is also a problem that you can solve it is a problem you should show how gab transforms under a coordinate transformation x x goes to x a goes to x prime b x prime b So under that transformation, ds square will go to what? ds prime square, but that, uh, that is equal to what? Good, good, right? Uh, please write it down. All of you, please write it down. You will only learn by writing. If you don't write, you will not learn. Because after some time you will forget everything. Whatever is being done on the board is right in now. But this doesn't change. Huh? This doesn't, this doesn't change. So this is equal to this. Good. This is equal to this. Uh, so G S prime square is equal to. So is it, you write this is equal to this is equal to G A B X. What are what are you got? Yes, good. Yes. Now now you have to uh, uh, change it. You can change it. Good.
it's better to use so you have use IJ, but it's better to use CD. Okay, IJ is also fine, it's not wrong. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> this is all this will be partial derivatives. Be careful. Yeah. I mean the thing is I'm saying, uh, just taking this this side, but uh, that is not mathematically uh -huh. correct. Uh -huh. So what will you do? So this is a nice problem, I think. For beginners, I think this is a nice problem. For experts, it will be very simple. Ah, good. Not alpha. See, now you should also look at the left hand side. No, you can't do it. It's not wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's fine. But it is good to put i and j. Because here you have i and j. That is what I'm saying. <coughs> good. Just follow this, you should get this. Again, partial derivative, not total derivative. No, oh, that is dx side, sorry. Del x prime b, del x j, <coughs> b x j. Now you have b x i, b x j on both sides. So you write down g i x, g i j x is equal to this. So by this procedure, what you are getting is a reverse transformation rather. So you have to again multiply. Oh, no, you can't do it. What? Whichever way you will get the same result. You could have instead of Taking this to i and j, you could have taken this to a and b. Yeah. Then it would, you would get the relation directly. But since you have done it on that side, then you have to take it on that side. That you can take it. It's not a problem. Good. But you want to find g prime a function of x prime as g function of x. How will you do that? Now go to the board. Hey, you go to the seat. I will tell you how to do it. Will we start from the left? No, that you can that you can do, then you will get the result directly. But this is also not wrong, this is also correct. But you have to take it on that side. But the thing is that you can see all you have got the result. This you just take this, just multiply it in x i got it. But that is not the not the correct way to do. That is what I am saying. Because <coughs> you see that A and B, these indices are summed over. So it is not really very good to cross multiply. No. So what you can do is the following. And similarly, the same thing on this side. <coughs> okay. So, the main thing is that <coughs> what we are doing here is you are putting some, some different indices on this side. Now, at these factors here, we will get some quantum factors. And from there, we will get the relation, the sort relation, g prime, x prime as gx. So please complete that thing and this is the reason the question that you asked was important that how do you know that these transforms are attained sir? The reason is that the line element is an invariant under coordinate transformation. Therefore it has to transform the metric tensor. So that is why we also give the name that it's metric tensor because it transforms like a tensor. Okay. Now, we shall come to something very important. Imagine a car like this, 
or the surface of the sphere. Okay. And at this point, you can have a tangent vector like this. Right? You can have a tangent vector. Now, on the surface of the sphere, at a particular point, there will be a tangent plane. Right? It's a tangent plane. So, imagine a surface of sphere like this, and you have at this point you have a tangent plane. And on the tangent plane, if that tangent plane will be attached to only one point on the surface of the sphere. And from that point, there can be infinitely many vectors whose origin is that point, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have this tangent plane. So there will be many vectors. Right? On that tangent plane. With this on the same point. These are all tangent plane. The important thing is that this tangent vector, you can see that it actually sticks outside the surface of the manifold. It is not totally on the surface of the sphere. It, only one point is on the surface of the sphere, but overall it is outside. It is not on the surface of the sphere. Similarly, at different points, we have different tangent planes and there will be different vectors. At this point on the Surface of the sphere, this is the tangent plane, and there will be vectors like this, this, and this. Okay. Let me call this point P, and let me call this point Q. <coughs> the question is I want to I want to subtract two vectors. Okay, that is not a problem. You can so two vectors defined on two different tangent planes. So this vector is defined at Q, and this vector is defined at the point P. And I want to carry out this operation, subtraction of these two vectors defined at two different points on the manifold. The question is: is this a tensorial operation or not? We shall see now that this is not a tensorial operation because this does not transform like a tensor. Let us prove it. <coughs> so now actually we shall we have come to a very important concept in geometry and that we shall discuss now. So our main goal is to now we, what we want to do is we want to define differentiation. We want to differentiate. We want to do differential calculus on the surface of a manifold. That is our aim. And for that we have to <coughs> there should be some rule by which you are able to take this vector defined at this point to this point. Our main goal, why do we subtract? Because when we subtract and then do something, some limiting procedure, we are able to calculate derivatives. Our goal is to calculate derivatives. And not only derivatives, we want to calculate derivatives which transform tensorially. I will show you now that this operation that we have here does not define, does not transform tensorially. Let us prove it. So let us consider once again, let us take this curve, it's characterized, this curve is gamma, it's characterized by lambda, this curve is called gamma, it's characterized by lambda, and we have points P and point Q. <coughs> this I label it as, okay, here you have a vector, it is P, here you have another vector Q. Okay. This point P, I call it a XB lambda, and this point Q I call say XB <coughs> XB plus B X B. Okay. So these are two, 
that is what uh, my goal is i want to differentiate so i take two points which are infinite similarly close to each other okay so <clears throat> and let us define the particular operation which which i shall denote it as baa i shall call baa to be this particular thing baa set q minus baa set t and my aim is to show that this does not transform in a tensorial way this is my aim <coughs> so let us put this A, A. Q is nothing but Hb plus Bsb. Okay. Now, since this this is infinite similarly small, so we can make a Taylor series expansion. Therefore, G A A. Equal to A A X B <coughs> plus A and higher order terms which I neglect, so I just put approximate. This order B S B square I, and higher order I neglect minus this cancels. So this is equal to I will just use the shorthand notation del del S B I shall denote it by del B del B So this particular object that is defined like this is basically this. <coughs> Under a coordinate transformation, once again x going to x prime. Under a coordinate transformation, this will go to del prime b. A prime A X prime. Right? So this I can write it down as del del X C A prime A. Del X C chain. Okay, this thing is equal to this thing X C X C X prime. A prime A. This is a vector, right? So it should transform like a vector. So this I can write it down as Del X C. This is therefore del x prime a del x b <coughs> a d x so I just look at this system. That is a differential. That is a differential. I mean, we know that uh, <coughs> the total thing, thing uh, should be tensorial or not. No, no, no. We cannot say about this. This is a differential. I am only worried about this coefficient. We will see why in a moment. Just need to look at the coefficient part, not the differential part. <coughs> in the coefficient parts uh, Accident. did not be tensorial. Just, just a minute. Just a minute. No, you will be able to define it. You will get a tensor. That is what I will show you. Just a minute. Del prime B. Oh, here I have done it. Okay, I used a different index. Okay. 
any any that is not a, okay just look at this part are you okay with this you're okay with this right this differential we don't need to look at i'm not interested about that because this dxb you cannot say that this is a vector or what is a differential vector will come when when you have a differentiation dxb dx d lambda and that is uv but this is not a vector this is a differential what is the differential what is the differential look at the coefficient I am not doing that. <coughs> okay. Let us come back to this thing. See, we have this part del prime B A prime A X prime equal. <clears throat> From here we get two terms, and what are those two terms? It will be del x prime a, del x b, <clears throat> del x prime a, del x b, <clears throat> then del a b. X C plus the second term is A D X there's two X prime A del X C del X D the two terms and you have del x c del x can be <coughs> and therefore equal to equal to the first term is del x by j del x B del x c del x prime b <coughs> del c. You know what the short shorthand notation is? Del c. This means del del x c. This is the first term. This multiplied by this, and the second term is this plus del. X C del X prime B del two X prime A del X C del X D Is it clear? So you can see from here that this term, this term transforms like this. The first term transforms like a vector. That is how, if it transforms like a vector, see the contravariant index x prime a is the dummy, and the covariant index is the covariant index. So another dummy c b c. So this transforms like a Tensor. But what spoils the tensorial property is the second term. This does not transform like a trans tensor, and therefore this quantity does not transform like a tensor. This does not have a tensorial property. <coughs> to have a proper tensorial form. What we shall do is we shall define a different operator. 
we had this operator we had this thing we had this thing which we just now calculated to have a proper tensorial property we shall define a different operator a different differential capital d a of a which is <coughs> I define a new differential operator instead of small d, which is basically this. I define a capital D, which is defined like this. This equivalent sign means defined. I define it. What is this A A T P? This is, if you remember, This AATP is basically the vector defined at AAQ transported to the point P. It's a vector defined at point Q transported. So you carry the vector to the point P. Huh? And transport. Parallel to use code one. I can use code one. Just little bit. Hang on a little bit. This part is very, very important. This is the main part, of the geometrical part. So concentrate on this. This is this. I put it over here and delta A, but this whole thing is nothing but this. By comparing, you can get delta A to the equal to this. What I am saying is that DAA does not transform tensorially. That I have shown you just now. This transforms my, my, I want this operator or this thing. DAA to transform in a tensorial way. This does not transform in a tensorial way. So this also does not transform in a tensorial way. So both of these objects do not transform in a tensorial way. The full thing transforms in a tensorial way. Okay? Good. So now, so far everything is fine. Now we have to provide a rule. So we know what 
dA is and what we want this to transform in a tensorial. So now we have to provide a rule. We will say that delta AA is basically linear in both AA, it is linear in both AA and DSP. This is a rule that I am providing to you by hand. I am saying that what, what should be the form of delta AA? It should be linear in AA and DSP. <clears throat> so delta A should be linear in A, B, A and B, S. So linear thing. But now there is a problem. You have indices to satisfy. We say you have some object gamma A. Please don't. So this is a new object. So delta A A, comma A B C A B D S C. So it is very defined. B B contracted, C C contracted. A is the free index. The free index should be on the both sides, same free index. This object is called a connection. This is called a connection. So now, when I am saying that I am transporting the vector from this point to this point. There are many ways to do that transport and to define this differentiation in a tensorial. One such way is this, this kind of a transport where you are putting in an extra structure on a manifold. And what is that extra structure? This is the extra structure that you put on the manifold now and this is called the connection. This you have to bring in, bring in by hand. There can be other ways of getting a differentiation, a very well defined differentiation thing which transforms to a tensorially, but there you don't need to bring any additional structure on the manifold. Here you are providing a rule by hand and bringing in an additional structure and that structure is this connection. <coughs> this gamma ABC is a non-tensorial because as I said that this I want it to transform in a tensorial way. This does not transform in a tensorial way. So this cannot transform in a tensorial way because a sum of two quantities, one which transforms in a tensor way, one which does not transform in a tensor way, cannot transform in a tensorial way. So if this has to transform in a tensorial way, and you know this does not transform in a tensorial way, this also must not transform in a tensorial way. Therefore, and now you have brought in this rule, you have written this, this delta A is linear in A, B, and B, and C. So you have to bring in some new structure on the manifold and then it's called gamma ABC, this is a connection. And this is some non-tensorial field, this does not transform in a tensorial field. And we will see how this actually transforms. More precisely, this is the function of X. And there are some notations that you should remember. Please don't write this as this. So it's See, this and this falls on the same line, vertical line. So in books, you will find that they are written in this way. But I don't know why, because nowadays you can write books in Latin. There is a comment by which you can shift this. The problem of writing this downstairs exactly in the vertical line is that if you want to take this downstairs, you cannot come here. You have to sit on top of B. So A cannot sit on top of B. So you should give a space for him. Now if you want to bring it down, you can write it down. So you should always remember this thing. You should never write it down A and B on the same line. This is for the connection. <coughs> and with this, with this definition, we can now write down what DAA is. That is equal to DA is what? Del B <coughs> D 
Dz. That is what we calculated. This sum. And what is delta A? A? That is gamma A B C A B. And therefore, this is equal to. <coughs> these are dummy indices. We can say that this is C and this is B. Or you could have done it in that in this case. This one, B, C. You can change this C. Change this to C. Because these are dummy indices. And therefore, you can write this as del C, A, A plus. Gamma A B C B B B C. <coughs> okay. So you have this quantity. <coughs> Dividing throughout by lambda, we shall now divide throughout by lambda. This is kind of a curious notation. You have a capital D divided by small d lambda. Okay. So dividing throughout by lambda, this is the increment in the curves parameter in the two points. This will give us basically I will call this grad B. Okay. Okay, let me call this B for the time. Let me call this B. B. This is B. C, B, C. Okay. So divide if you divide by grand lambda, d lambda throughout, and this particular object I shall call grad B, K of K, B X B, B lambda. But here B d lambda, this is the grand B K. K The tangent vector. <coughs> so we have a nice relation. We have B is equal to One more property that is gamma a symmetric. This connection is symmetric in the lower indices. This derivative is called the covariant derivative. And my demand, my my claim is was that this operator that we had here, this transforms in a tensorial way. So the claim is that this particular thing or the covariant derivative here is transforms in a tensorial because this is a tensor, this is a tensor, this must be a tensor. This is my claim. So if we have this claim, then the question is from there, see we did not specify, we only told that this gamma transforms in a non-tensorial way. But, and my claim is that this has to transform in a tensorial. So from there, you can actually calculate how does this gamma transform. And you will indeed find that this, this gamma transforms in a non-tensorial. We shall do it now. We shall calculate it now. 
<coughs> so since gravity a a is a tensor can you say a tensor of what type which a uh, fixed tensor but what type 1 comma 1, 1, 1, 1. 1 so this is a tensor of type 1 comma 1 we are demanding that this must be a tensor of 1 comma 1 and that is how we are actually define the differentiation of two vectors how can you do differential calculus how can you differentiate between two vectors so what the physical idea was two vectors are different at two are defined at two different points you bring one of the vectors to this point by transporting the vector to this point and you demand you put in a rule that <coughs> this extra part which transforms non tensor into linear in ab and dx from there since if you define it in this way you have to bring in a in an additional structure of crystal symbol and from there you are going to get this relation this is called the covariant derivative this transforms like a tensor that we have demanded and the covariant derivative is given by this formula so from this demand that this is a covariant derivative therefore this transforms in a tensorial way we now proceed to find the transformation property of this connection okay let us see how does it transform i can i can tell you that this is a <coughs> this is you need to know the transformation property of the crystal of this this connection this is by the way this is called the crystal connection we need to find out the transformation property of this object but before even calculating what we can say is that this does not transform like a tensor that you can say already <coughs> so let us see how can we uh, deduce the transformation property of this thing so grad let me write down this equation once one second grad b a a is del b del a plus <coughs> we have written it down in the following way comma a b okay if you look at it carefully we earlier had it as comma a c b So let us not put any. Uh, you, you are putting B C, so comma C B. You can put it as comma B C, just because of symmetry. But let us keep it at as C B instead of B C. So comma is C B, and then it will be what? It will be A C. We know how this transforms. We just need to calculate how this transforms. <coughs> so this. Under general coordinate transformations, x to x prime, this will transform to gamma. So this is a function of x, obviously. So gamma prime a, c b function of x prime, a prime c function of x prime. So go to this. <coughs> is it okay? So under This, this will go to this, but this is equal to this will be equal to grad prime b a prime a x prime minus del prime b a prime b. Why? Because gamma a b is is basically grad this minus this. If a gamma prime will be prime minus prime. This transforms like a tensor, so you know what it is. What should this be? This should be del x prime b. Let me see the indices that I have used. Let's see, I have used c. Del x c, <coughs> del x here. I think I have used d. Good. Del b, del x prime b, grad. Just a minute. Just a minute. Would make a mistake. Just check. A hole, huh? Yeah. A. A. C. X. B. X. B. And then we have what? 
Because this we know, this transforms like a tail set. That is what we had demanded. And this, you already know the transformation property, so you just put it there. <coughs> so this will be minus del x prime a. Again, I will just look at the indices del x prime a, I have used c. Okay. C del x c, and then del x. B, then B, 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 but this is only one of the terms. You have another term because this does not transform in a tensorial way, and the other term is minus. So this is uh, there is a minus. So this will be minus. Del two x prime del x <coughs> del two x prime del x c del c is del two x prime del x c del x d. There is another term multiplied by that del x d. Then x prime b, and there should be one a. Yes, sir. Right? Ah, uh, kunda? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. B is contracted, sir. Oh, I see. So this you just put the transformation property of this. So this one is two terms. <coughs> Good. Now, what we need to do is when we have this, okay. it's fine. So what you can do is you can see that you can compare, you can take these two terms. So these two terms are basically same, right? So what you can write is. Right. But it's common. This is this. But what is gravity in this thing? This. Gamma. A. <coughs> what was that? I forgot. This is why this is quite. Let me. So it was like this. No? It was grad D. It was grad D AC minus del D AC. Na? I check for. It a muche dilam. Grad D AC minus del D AC. So that we can actually write it down as gamma C. Grad, huh? Is it okay? Right. This is correct. This is grad grad D A C minus that thing. So you can see that this this object first term like a tensor, it transforms like a tensor. But there is the last term which actually spoils the tensorial property. <coughs> Right. So now what you have to do? You could have gamma take bar kore and go. What What is your suggestion? How should we proceed? Huh? What is our aim? We are, our aim is to find the transformation property of gamma. But this gamma, this gamma is multiplied by a. So what should we do now? Uh, a prime c x prime we write it in terms of this very good. So a prime c x prime you can write it down as del x prime c. Let me again see what index I have used. Uh, I have used P. Del x e. 
dx. And this is also a to x. Okay. This t is a dummy index. So you can make this p e. So now you can immediately write since a e is an arbitrary vector, just look at this line very carefully. A line to show it. Now see left hand side you have a e, a e, a e. Since A is an arbitrary vector, cancel it. Good. So we have now nine. So the vector is gone now. Now there is nothing more to do. You can just get rid of this. This line. This line is confusing. Get rid of this. <coughs> gamma prime a c b x prime del x prime c del x e. So what do you need to do now? You have to get rid of this factor. Just multiply. Just multiply by del x e del x prime x both sides. So that will give us. It will be multiplied here also. So multiply both sides by this factor del x e del x prime f. So here you can see that this one by chain rule del x prime c del x prime f is what delta c f. So delta c f if you if you contract it with this, so c will go out. This will become f. So this is also gone. So this full thing is gone. So you have gamma prime a f b prime function of x prime that is equal to this thing. <coughs> and now you can see since there are three indices, so del x prime a del x c contraction gamma c. Then you have del x e del x prime f because of this index. Contraction gamma e, and then you have this b del x d del x prime b b. So the first term transforms like a tensor. This thing is equal to this thing. First term transforms like a tensor, but then you have del x e del x prime f also multiplied by this. So that gives you the full transformation property of the Christoffel connection, and you can see that this terms follows the tensorial property of gamma. So do you have any questions? Do you? We are together. So do you have any questions at this point? Is this becoming too heavy or is this okay for me? So heavy, not okay. Soft, soft. Because you know these things, you guys know all these things. Darshan, clear. Hello, clear. Gumpachi. 
my name is to calculate what basis <coughs> now what is d a a it again i will write that this is p a <coughs> this is grad b a a yes this part multiply by d lambda u b d lambda okay that is how i define u b was d x b d lambda <coughs> so this part i know i have put it here plus i have b e a j <clears throat> now what is the left hand side p a a a we have seen already at the beginning of the lecture that this transforms like a scalar okay so scalar this what is for a scalar this capital d you can replace it by ordinary d because this also transforms like a tensor remember df df d lambda transforms like a tensor so ordinary d can, can be replaced by a like capital d can be replaced by an ordinary d again like needs rule because all derivative rule all derivative operator should have chain rule should obey chain rule so you can write this as pa b a a <coughs> plus b p a a this is what we have <coughs> <clears throat> okay so what should we do now if we have this b a a so that we will apply it this we will apply it in what let's write this equation on top Sir, I don't understand that part. So why are we writing uh, capital D replacing capital D as small? Current capital D is small. P A for a scalar, you don't need the connection. The why? scalar scalar transforms like a scalar transforms like a tensor of type zero comma zero without the connection. You don't need the connection. P is key energy, connection energy, capital D. Scalar is just make capital D or small D. Connection the last bit that transforms like a tensor because we have already shown. Suppose this is my this was F A U A which was F D F D lambda transforms like a scalar that we have shown. So capital D taka means small D D F is going to be equal. So let me write this equation on top once again. E A B A A plus <coughs> B P A A A is equal to P A grad B A A. Dxb plus a. That's our equation. So you can remove this. <coughs> okay. Now this implies p a b a a. You can write this as Dxb chain rule. I can of p b a import that of I will go del p a del x b dxb again chain rule. Okay. For this p a 
এবার আমি ডেল বি এ এটা বসিয়ে দেব আই উইল সাবস্টিটিউট হোয়াট দা কোভেরিয়েন্ট ডেরিভেটিভ ইজ ডেল বি এ এ প্লাস গামা এ সি বি is it okay tell them you can see that this term cancels with this term pa is php same term <coughs> so now what do we have so this is the equation so let me just move all this clutter it is not needed so what we have is b p a a a is equal to you know this माइनस <laughs> नाउ <clears throat> what we need to do is the following a a comma this b and b a c okay i am writing this kind of thing we just check a a b b a this is equal to what is equal to a a then we p a okay this is fine gamma a c b a c p a u b fine fantastic so now what i shall do is i shall divide by denominator so if you divide by denominator throughout but d s b d denominator is nothing but u b this is also in ha kisi ne gor gor aache hai na let's see if you need x a the baat hai to bolna
that's all. Now I think the job is done, and this I can write it down as what H A U B. That is fine. So this is del B C A minus gamma C A B. Now this vector A is, is completely arbitrary and get rid of this. This is one. And now this I will define it as grad E C A where grad B P A is L B P A ordinary derivative minus gamma C A B B C. This part is full. So you have B P A D lambda that is grad B P A U B where grad B P A is this. So you can see that the covariant derivative of a tensor of type 0, 1 for a covariant vector is basically given by this. So instead of a plus sign, we have a minus sign. <coughs> I will just write one more result. You can find it out yourself. But there is no need to do, to do that. You can generalize this for tensors of higher, higher rank. So suppose if I take grad C T A B, the first term is very easy to write. It is del C ordinary derivative. So this is a weak tensor because it's a tensor of type 1, 1. This is an ordinary derivative. The second term for the contravariant index, you have a plus gamma. Okay. <coughs> you put this three index on top of this gamma A, and then you put this derivative index C here, and then just write P over here. P you keep, keep fixed because there is only one test over here for it to go. You put a dumb index D, D, D. So this is the first term. And so here you see that B remains fixed, C is always already there. And for this index, you put a minus gamma. There is minus here, and now this will go here, gamma b. The derivative index will always go here in the gamma, so that is here. <coughs> now p, instead of b, you don't have b sitting here, so you have to put <coughs> dummy index here, so and this one will be what? b and this is a. Because A remains fixed now, B comes here, C is always there, the remaining index is B, B has, B has to be contacted. So, this is, so in this way, you can generalize covariant derivatives, say T, A, or gamma D, A, B, C. You can try to write this down, or maybe this tensor of type 1, comma T. Covariant derivative. You can try to write this covariant derivative by following this rule. Upper index you have to put in a plus gamma, lower index you have to put in two minus gamma. For each lower index you have to put in minus gamma. There are two separate terms. So today what what we have learned from uh, in, in today's lecture is that is that what is a covariant derivative? So how we have a rule for transporting pressure from one point to another point. So that we have learned, and we have also learned how to take covariant derivatives of contravariant vectors, covariant vectors, and also mixed tensors of this kind. So from here, we'll start the next class. So next class, I think we'll take it on Monday. Let us take it on I was thinking of taking a class on Saturday, but let us do it on Monday. So if you have any questions, you can ask.
do you have any questions now If there are no questions, then let us stop here for today.